Hey, Alki Historica here. As many of you have noticed, we leftists really like trains. Car bad, train good, as they say. Even if you aren't a leftist, you probably remember learning about the important role railroads played in American history and how they connected East and West, the old nation to the new. What you probably didn't learn, at least not in detail, was about how these railroads were actually constructed and who built them. So today, we're going to cover the workers who laid down countless miles of track to construct America's railroads in the mid-19th century. While the construction practices I'm going to describe took place on various railroads, I wanted to initially focus on the construction of the United States' first and finest railroad, the Baltimore and Ohio. In my video on the American North, I briefly mentioned the completion of the Erie Canal in 1825 and its impact on the early American economy. That same year in England, the Stockton and Darlington Railway was completed and its early success was noted by one of the sons of financier George Brown, among others. This railway success proved to bankers and merchants in Baltimore that railroads not only had the possibility to keep Baltimore economically relevant in the 19th century, but would also one day surpass turnpikes and canals. In March of 1827, the Baltimore and Ohio Railroad was chartered by Maryland and Virginia with the goal of constructing a railroad that would stretch from Baltimore to the Ohio River, hence the name. Existing railroads like the Motch Creek Line and the Granite Railway proved to the investors that construction was possible, though there were some concerns with how well horses and later steam engines might perform, leading to grades being limited to no more than 0.6% during the surveying phase. Many early American railroads chose to have the tracks follow the contour of the land whenever possible to avoid having to construct expensive bridges, tunnels, and embankments, and because these projects were staffed by relatively unskilled labor. American railroads tended to have steeper grades and sharper curves than European railways for this reason. In 1828, the management of the Baltimore and Ohio decided to hold an official commencement of the railroad on July 4th, symbolic not only because it was the anniversary of the Declaration of Independence, but also because all of the great canal projects had begun on July 4th. When the day arrived, there was a parade of floats representing the various trades in Baltimore, such as the bakers, bleachers, and tailors, along with bands and a large crowd, who made their way to the James Carroll estate where the ceremony was held. A 90-year-old Charles Carroll, the last living signer of the Declaration of Independence, broke ground and the first stone was laid in place by the Masonic Lodge of Baltimore, marking the start of the construction of the Baltimore and Ohio. Three days later, construction on the river began on the first section of track, which would stretch roughly 13 miles from Pratt Street in Baltimore to Ellicott's Mills. This stretch was divided into 26 different contracts, and for much of the 19th century, this seems to have been the norm. An entire project would be divided into roughly mile-long segments that would be given to contractors. Contractors would then hire men from the local populace, usually any available labor such as farmhands who had little to no knowledge of the techniques needed in constructing railroads. These projects required large amounts of backbreaking labor, usually in the form of Irish immigrants, or in the case of the South, slaves. Slaves, unsurprisingly, constructed most of the antebellum South's nearly 9,000 miles of track. Slave owners hired out their slaves to railroad companies on yearly contracts, though many slaves did not survive them. Slaves had a much higher mortality rate than white workers, to the point that many slave owners refused to hire out their slaves, not because they empathized with their slaves, of course, but because to them, losing a slave was losing a valuable asset. It was these contracted groups that actually built early railroads as opposed to construction companies, which did no actual construction and instead acted as a buffer between the railroad companies and contractors, and assumed any financial risk to keep the actual railroad company from going bankrupt. One of the first challenges of the Baltimore and Ohio was deciding what materials would be used to construct the two necessary bridges. Lieutenant Colonel Long preferred wooden bridges, while builder Casper Weaver preferred more expensive stone bridges. Wood was typically the choice for bridges used on early railroads. However, the Baltimore and Ohio directors wanted a more permanent edifice and chose to go with the stone design. In fact, one of the bridges constructed, the Carrollton Viaduct, still stands to this day. Before a single section of track was laid down, the route would have been cleared of trees and other vegetation, and grading would have been done to keep the grade of the tracks under 0.6%. This included cutting and filling, that is, removing or adding earth to achieve a desired ground level. The tracks were first laid down in 1829, with the directors deciding that the gauge, or distance between the rails, would be standard English gauge, or 4 feet 8.5 inches. Okay, so railroad gauge is a pretty interesting topic. It could be quite large and chosen for various different reasons. The New York and Erie Railroad initially used a six-foot gauge, while Isambard Kingdom Brunel, who I think of as a sort of 19th century Jeremy Clarkson, chose to use a seven-foot and a quarter-inch gauge on the Great Western. If I remember correctly, in Canada, they used a railway gauge of five feet six inches to slow any possible invasion from the United States. The Pacific Railroad was originally going to use a 5-foot gauge, though thanks to lobbying from the New York Central and Baltimore and Ohio, this was changed to standard gauge. 
Anyway, at first the method used to construct railroads was to lay wrought iron rails and stone blocks, or to attach strap rail to wooden stringers that were on stone blocks. Strap rail was basically just long sections of cut wood with thin iron straps nailed to them, which saved money especially considering that the iron was imported from England. These methods cost between $5,000 and $6,500 per mile due to the inclusion of the stone blocks, so a third method of laying strap rail and wooden stringers, which were attacked to wooden sleepers, was adopted, as it only cost $4,000 per mile. Dirt was placed in between the rails in order to create a path for the horses that would pull the carts initially. And I know what you're thinking, the only horses I'm interested in are iron horses. Well don't worry, we're gonna get there. Construction did not go without incident. In February of 1829, while workers were digging a deep cut through a hill, it collapsed, killing four Irish workers. Some other hazards early workers would have faced included potential attacks from wild animals, diseases such as cholera and malaria, and harsh living conditions. Much like with canal workers, housing was basically a tent and not much more than that. In January of 1830, the first mile and a half section from Pratt Street to Carrollton Viaduct was open to the public. A one-way trip cost just nine cents, and this new mode of transportation became rather popular. In late May of 1830, the 13-mile section from Pratt Street to Ellicott's Mills was completed, and I'll talk about its success in a future video. So, sometimes early railroads needed to go through steep hills and mountains. Fast forwarding to the late 1840s, the Baltimore and Ohio at this point was expanding from Cumberland to the Ohio River, and the route chosen required the construction of three tunnels. Tunneling in the 1840s was a very difficult task and called for the employment of mine workers, like in the case of the Kingwood Tunnel. The Kingwood Tunnel, at the time of its completion in 1852, was the longest tunnel in the United States and required 300 men using hand drills and black powder to blast through the mountain. They dug vertical shafts in the middle of the proposed tunnel route to allow excavation from several points, speeding up the process of digging the tunnel. The shafts were typical of local mining operations, as was the technique of hand drilling holes into the rock, filling them with black powder and detonating the powder. This technique was quite dangerous, especially because the quality of the rock on the eastern section made it prone to rock falls. Temporary timber shoring was used to prevent cave-ins, though rock falls were frequent enough that permanent arching was sought. However, this proved to be as difficult as boring because removing the original wooden arches caused the earth to fall on workers with such frequency that watchmen were employed to warn of rock slides. Eventually, a sort of cast iron and sandstone arch combination was used to line the eastern section of the tunnel and proved to be successful at preventing rock slides. We're now going to depart from the Baltimore and Ohio, though we will talk about it again in a future video. Another interesting example of the dangers early railroad workers faced was on the New York and Erie Railroad. When the railroad was expanding along the Delaware River, it was forced to blast its own right of way on the cliffs located on the Pennsylvania side of the river, thanks to lobbying by the Delaware and Hudson Canal. Near Port Jervis, workers were allegedly lowered in baskets from the top of the cliffs, where they hand drilled holes into the rock and filled them with gunpowder hundreds of feet off the ground. One poor soul was then tasked with lighting the fuse and signaling to the men above to yank them up with haste. More often than not, the ropes would be snagged and the explosion would send the poor soul plummeting to his death. Perhaps it was for this reason that workers on the Erie Railroad often came into conflict with workers on the D&H Canal, apparently fighting and even shooting at each other. Erie Railroad laborers were so resentful of the D&H Canal that they would intentionally wait for barges to pass by before detonating their charges to shower the canal workers with debris. Though, given what the canal put them through, I guess you can't really blame them. The United States network of railroads expanded from 9,000 miles to 30,000 miles in the 1850s, and while I could focus on the construction of any number of railroads like the Chesapeake and Ohio Railway, the New York Central Railroad, or even the Pennsylvania Railroad, I figured that y'all would be much more interested in what is considered the United States' greatest engineering feat of the 19th century. Now we're going to talk about the Union Pacific Railroad and the construction of the Transcontinental Railroad, or as it was called for much of the 19th century, the Pacific Railroad. Quick in and out, hopefully not 20 minute tangent, by the 1850s several men had pushed the idea for uniting the east coast and the west coast by rail. One of the earliest was Hartwell Carver, who proposed this idea to congress in 1832 and was rightfully rejected. This was six years prior to a railroad from Dubuque to Milwaukee proposed in the House of Representatives. Here's a description of how the house responded. This produced a great laugh and hurrah in the house, members singing out to me that it would not be long before my constituents would ask Congress to build a railroad to the moon. Asa Whitney was the first prominent proponent of the Transcontinental Railroad. He was inspired by his long journey of 153 days from the East Coast to China and by the potential to make large amounts of money. While in China, he made trade connections along with a vast amount of money, enough in fact that he was able to retire. He envisioned that a transcontinental railroad would make it much easier to sell Chinese goods in the United States and Europe. 
He spent several years during the 1840s attempting to convince Congress to approve such a project, but ultimately was unsuccessful. However, he inspired civil engineer Theodore Judah to survey a potential route over the Sierra Nevada mountains and to find investors for what eventually became the Central Pacific. The United States authorized the Pacific Railroad Act of 1862, which granted land to the Central Pacific Railroad and the Union Pacific Railroad and helped them finance the project with 30-year 6% U.S. government bonds. While many in Congress were still skeptical of such a project, President Lincoln was strongly in favor of a transcontinental railroad. Lincoln didn't just want to reunite the North and the South, but he also wanted to unite the East and the West and knew that the government funding would be needed to accomplish this goal. The Transcontinental Railroad was as much a political project as it was an engineering one. The Union Pacific broke ground on December 2, 1863 in Omaha, Nebraska, even though people often say it was originally started in Council Bluffs, Iowa. This is probably because both Council Bluffs and Omaha today are part of the Omaha Council Bluffs metropolitan area, and because Lincoln intended on the railroad to start in Council Bluffs. But Thomas Doc Durant, vice president of the Union Pacific, announced that Omaha would be the eastern terminus. Durant did this because he had land investments in Omaha and stood to profit heavily if it started in that city. By the way, I'm leaving out much of the financial history of the Union Pacific, but let me just say there were cartoonish amounts of corruption at every step. For instance, Durant actually lengthened the route by having the railroad built 8 miles south to Bellevue before bending back northwest for the sole reason of making him more money. Anyway, if you have ever been to either Council Bluffs or Omaha, then you can see a big problem here, the Missouri River. The Union Pacific had to transport supplies and rolling stock across the Missouri River until a bridge was finally constructed in 1872, though in winter when the river froze they used sleds. It took an additional year and a half or until 1865 for the Union Pacific to actually start laying significant amounts of rail, as it struggled to find investors and because there was a label shortage thanks to the Civil War. When the war ended in spring of 1865, the Union Pacific finally found its labor source. Just like back east, Irish immigrants were the dominant ethnic group on the railroad, though there were many freedmen, Germans, even some Swedes. Many of these men were Civil War veterans looking for employment in the post-Civil War United States, which benefited the Union Pacific because these veterans were disciplined and relatively skilled compared to the railroad workers from years prior. Even one of the heads of construction, Grenville Dodge, had been an officer in the Union Army. Accommodation was better than it had been on previous railroads. John Casement, who led the work crews, designed a work train based on Civil War hospital trains that featured a kitchen, all the tools and equipment necessary, even large boxcars with bunks. Casement's train was known as the Perpetual Train because it was never stationary for long, and it was very impressive. At the front were cars that carried tools, supplies, and even an area for blacksmithing. Next were three bunkhouse cars, 85 feet long and 8 feet from floor to ceiling, where many workers slept. Though space was limited, and many still chose to sleep in hammocks under the train or pinch tents on the roof, as sleeping in boxcars with dozens of other men who rarely bathed made it, uh, uncomfortable to say the least. Behind these cars was a dining car where the men scarfed down their meals of coffee, bread, beef, and maybe even beans, sharing utensils with the men around them. Further back was a kitchen car, pantry car, some engineer office cars, flat cars with supplies, and storeroom cars filled with rifles, and at the very end of the train were the three American style or 240 locomotives pushing the train across the Great Plains. Behind the train were the horse pull wagons filled with additional supplies, and a massive herd of 300 head of cattle that supplied the meat for the men, though men would also hunt buffalo and even bears for meat. Caseman even set up a ranch to replenish the herd to ensure he would have enough beef for the duration of the construction. Now that we know who these men were and what their accommodation was like, let's take a look at how the work crews were organized. The whole process started with surveyors, who marked the optimal path of the railroad with wooden posts, often traveling hundreds of miles in front of the track layers and exploring the beautiful terrain of the west. They were the ones who would decide what cuts or fills would be needed. Next came the graders ahead of the track laying party by only a couple of miles. They constructed the track ballast or roadbed with shovels, pickaxes, and wheelbarrows two feet above the prairie to protect the railroad from flooding. Hundreds of men first stood in line waiting to have their wheelbarrows filled and then waited in another line to dump their load at the exact spot the dumping boss indicated. The boss would then pat the dirt flat with a shovel. This step was so crucial that there were several bosses and supervisors who oversaw the entire process. Walking bosses, stable bosses, dumping bosses, and the boarding boss above them all. Men from this group were also responsible for constructing any of the necessary cuts, fills, or trestles. Trestles required stone foundations but were primarily made of timber and iron bolts. Following them were horse-drawn carts carrying ties or the wind supports that the rails would rest on and the carts that carried the rails, bolts, fish plates, or spike joints, and spikes. 
Once the ties were placed, five strong men would then lift the rails and place them onto the ties. And strong they had to be. These rails weighed between 500 and 700 pounds, and yet crews were able to lay a rail in as little as 30 seconds. Despite that, they often placed the rails in perfect position as confirmed by the gauger using a track gauge. A track gauge was little more than a piece of wood used to measure the space between the rails. Then came the spikers who drove long spikes through the rails and ties. The whole process of constructing the railroad was done with great haste as described here. Close behind come the men who spike the rails, and a lively time they make of it. It is a grand anvil chorus that those sturdy sledges are playing across the plains. It is in triple time, three strokes per spike, ten spikes to a rail, 400 rails to a mile, 1800 miles to San Francisco. Workers were charged $20 a month for board, but how much they earned depended on the job they were doing. Graders and teamsters earned about $2.50 a day. Spikers received $3 a day. Ironmen, who had to be physically fit and able to lift heavy rail, received $3 to $4 a day. Working conditions varied as we'll see, depending on the season and the job one was completing. Accidents were a common occurrence on the railroad and were caused by drunkenness, bad luck, or haste. Men lost fingers and had limbs crushed in accidents, but it appears that injuries became a mark of pride amongst workers. Any serious injury was effectively a death sentence. Once the rails were laid, they were ready for use by the work train and the passenger trains that followed weeks later. In October of 1866, the Union Pacific passed the 100th meridian, earning their right to continue westward. However, the Union Pacific was struggling with funding itself, and in order to attract new investors, Durant invited many wealthy and prominent individuals, including future President Rutherford B. Hayes, to travel to the 100th Meridian for a celebration and to see the Great Plains for themselves. While out on the prairie, the guests were awoken from their slumber and astonished to hear whooping and yelling from the Pawnee, word that they might befall some horrid fate. But the entire thing was staged. Durant had hired the Pawnee from a nearby reservation to wake up the wealthy visitors, and later that day, the Pawnee even staged a mock battle where some of the Pawnee dressed up as Sioux. The Pawnee and the Sioux were hostile to each other because of numerous raids from the Sioux, and it was for this reason, at least in part, that the Pawnee allied with the U.S. government. Many Pawnee served in the Army as scouts, especially in order to protect workers on the Union Pacific. The Union Pacific in exchange gave the Pawnee free rides on work trains and gifts. In fact, some of them would later be hired by a buffalo hunter on the Kansas Pacific Railroad named William F. Cody, better known as Buffalo Bill. Progress stalled at the end of 1866 due to construction of a bridge across the North Platte River and then a series of harsh blizzards which lasted until 1867. The snowstorms were so severe that work stopped for several weeks in North Platte, where a small impromptu town formed. This was one of the first Hell on Wheels towns, where people hoping to relieve the railroad workers of their cash set up gambling houses, saloons, and brothels. This was not surprising, as other than shops set up by Jack Casement, these workers had virtually nothing else to purchase out west. Many soon gambled their money away, or spent it on whiskey and sex workers, alongside miners and traders. Every card game you could think of was played here, and establishment owners all had half-cocked rifles or pistols within reach. In Hell on Wheels towns, whiskey was easier to find than water. Every month, men would get paid and use their earnings to buy large amounts of whiskey. Progress on the railroads often suffered as men were so hungover they couldn't work. These towns were just like the boom towns out west, constructed with temporary buildings and operating with no law enforcement at all. To say that murder and theft were common would be an understatement. In fact, armed workers and citizens of the town often shot each other, and the mortality rate was estimated to be four times higher in these towns than it was on the job site. Though many of the Hell on Wheels towns were abandoned shortly after the Union Pacific continued, some still became fully functioning towns. For instance, North Platte is still an important city and the site of Union Pacific's Bailey Yard, the world's largest railroad yard. Even into March of 1867, the snow gave workers trouble as the men would spend hours clearing the tracks only for a snowstorm to cover the track in what seemed like minutes. But even as temperatures warmed, the Union Pacific continued to struggle as snow melted and led to extreme flooding. Large sections of the roadbed were washed away, and before supply trains from the east could reach the construction party, large sections of the track had to be repaired and rebuilt. Once the repairs were completed, the Union Pacific continued westwards, often laying as much as two to three miles of rail a day, well into the fall, when Union Pacific reached Cheyenne on November 13, 1867. The Union Pacific pushed hard to make up for lost time, despite temperatures over 100 degrees Fahrenheit during the summer. This wasn't all bad for the workers, as men earned more for laying more track per day. What they certainly considered bad, though, was the increase in attacks from indigenous peoples. The construction of the Transcontinental Railroad was settlers engaging in what Dr. Manu Karuka calls continental imperialism in their work Empire's Tracks, Indigenous Nations, Chinese Workers, and the Transcontinental Railroad, which I'm currently reading for a future series about settler colonialism. 
The purpose of the Homestead Act and the Pacific Railroad Act was to entice settlers and to make travel to the West much more convenient. The railroad was needed to make Manifest Destiny, or the idea that the nation would extend from sea to shining sea, a reality, and Americans were willing to commit crimes against humanity to achieve it. On November 29, 1864, the Third Colorado Cavalry committed the Sand Creek Massacre, where they killed an estimated 150 Arapaho and Cheyenne, most of whom were women and children. The Cheyenne, Arapaho, and Lakota responded with the Battle of Julesburg on January 7, 1865, killing several soldiers and a handful of civilians. These two main events led to a series of exchanges on the Union Pacific that lasted until the railroad's completion. Indigenous peoples rightfully resisted and attacked the railroad in various ways, including stealing horses, mules, and cattle from graders, and driving surveyors and graders from their positions to the point they didn't even want to work on the railroad anymore, unless the army increased its presence. Even after the United States began to increase their military presence near the Union Pacific, the Sioux were still able to easily steal pack animals from work crews. Dodge himself once witnessed several Sioux release horses and escape before men could get to their rifles. He was so infuriated that he claimed that unless the natives were cleaned out, the Union Pacific could not be finished. English surveyor James Evans was much more explicit. The hostility of the Indians made explorations extremely difficult and dangerous. What was Evans' proposed solution? Until they are exterminated, or so far reduced in numbers as to make their power contemptible, no safety will be found in the vast district extending from Fort Kearney to the mountains and beyond. For settlers, genocide was the only way to ensure that the railroad, that settler colonialism, would be successful. Dodge would appeal to General Sherman to protect the railroads. Sherman would later say of the Sioux, after the completion of the Transcontinental Railroad, We must act with vindictive earnestness against the Sioux, even to the extermination, men, women, and children. While I will cover several specific instances of resistance to settler colonialism in the future, for the sake of time, I want to talk about two that were directed at the Union Pacific. On August 8, 1867, near Plum Creek, some Cheyenne were inspecting a section of track and one of them came up with an idea. Porcupine, at this point a medicine man who would later become a chief, recalls in this quote that settlers had taken so much from the Cheyenne that they decided to see if they could derail a train. Now the white people have taken all we had and have made us poor, and we ought to do something. In these big wagons that go in this metal road, there must be things that are valuable, perhaps clothing. If we could throw these wagons off the iron they run on and break them open, we should find out what was in them and take whatever might be useful to us. They placed a big stick on the rails and waited until a handcar with five men could be heard. The men on the handcar saw the Cheyenne and attempted to rush past, but the handcar hit the stick and flew into the air. The five men scattered. Repairman William Thompson was shot in the arm, caught, and I'll let him describe what happened next. Content warning, this is rather violent, so skip ahead to this time in order to avoid this section. He commenced sawing and hacking away at my scalp. He gave the last finishing cut to the scalp on my left temple, and as it hung a little, he gave it a jerk. It just felt as if the whole head was taken right off. After Thompson's scalp was cut off, it was accidentally dropped. Thompson was able to recover his severed scalp and waited until the first opportunity to escape running some miles to Willow Island Station before being picked up by a train. He was later transported to Omaha with his scalp in a bucket of water, where many gawked at his scalpless head before a surgeon attempted to retach it. It was 1867, so, um, of course it didn't work. Sources tell me Thompson's scalp was initially put on display in the Omaha Public Library, and hilariously, it was displayed in the children's section. Today, you can see this man's scalp in the Union Pacific Museum in Council Bluffs, Iowa. I'm not joking. This was not before Thompson witnessed the Cheyenne rip up a section of track and attack an approaching work train. The train hit the gap, crashing into a great mess. The engineer and the head brakeman were crushed by the locomotive, while the crew in the caboose escaped and warned a second approaching train. The Cheyenne went through the derailed box cars, taking all sorts of goods and later setting fire to the cars. A year later, a similar event took place. In late 1868, once again near Plum Creek, there was a major act of resistance against the Union Pacific. This time, young Sioux, led by Pawnee Killer, used tools to bend the rails backward and created a pile of wooden ties to derail a train. Just to be sure, they climbed a telegraph pole and ripped the wire down, tying the whole mess together. Not too long after, a work train hit the obstruction and was sent flying through the air. Bricks from two of the flat cars were sent flying all along the right of way. The fireman and the engineer were crushed by the locomotive, while the head brakeman, rear brakeman, and conductor ran away narrowly escaping with their lives. It is important to remember that these were acts of resistance from the colonized against the colonizers. The Transcontinental Railroad affected different nations in different ways. The railroad disrupted the trade routes of the Cheyenne and depleted the food source of all indigenous peoples by killing as many buffalo as possible. 
Settlers felt justified killing so many buffalo because herds delayed the progress of the railroad and damaged the rails after it had been completed. In the future, we'll talk more about the effects of settlers on the Great Plains in depth as this topic is too often neglected. And when it isn't neglected, the way that settlers attempt to cover it is, uh, let's just say problematic. As 1867 came to a close, the Union Pacific pushed past Cheyenne and began preparing the roadbed that would extend over the Rocky Mountains. By mid-January of 1868, a snowstorm dropped up to three feet of snow within a few hours, and once again work stopped for the winter when temperatures here could easily dip below zero degrees Fahrenheit. When work resumed, graders in the Union Pacific faced a new challenge, granite. Granite is very dense, and the only way the Union Pacific graders were able to construct a roadbed here was by blasting it, a very expensive and labor-intensive endeavor. The railroad chose the path of least resistance to minimize the amount of blasting, even deciding to build at a grade of 90 feet per mile to the summit. Grading crews blasted and cut through dense granite until finally on April 16th, crews laid rails across what is today known as Sherman Summit in honor of the genocidal General Sherman, who had committed thousands of troops to protect the railroad. Sherman Summit, at an elevation of 8,200 feet, was the highest anyone had laid tracks in the world at that point. Around the same time, the bridge crews who worked over 100 feet off the ground with virtually no safety equipment in a time before OSHA or hazard pay completed Dale Creek Crossing. 650 feet long, 150 feet tall, and secure with wires, this bridge was quite the sight as the first locomotive went over it on April 23rd at the brisk pace of 4 miles per hour. I'd call it a hold your breath bridge, except at that speed, you'd faint. I mean, if you didn't already faint from fear of falling, which was a very realistic possibility since at least three Union Pacific bridges were so poorly built they collapsed before a train even went over them. The Union Pacific, after completing the difficult challenges, pressed onwards over the Continental Divide and towards Utah through the Red Desert of Wyoming. Building a railroad through the desert presents its own challenges. Temperatures over 100 degrees during the day and below freezing at night, which killed tens of pack animals assisting the workers. Men suffered from heat exhaustion and severe sunburns while wearing water-soaked masks, a vain attempt at keeping the dust out of their mouths. Water had to be shipped to the worksite until the railroad could construct wells, some of which are allegedly still in use today. Sometimes laying over three miles of track a day in grueling heat, the men were encouraged by bonuses and whiskey to lay as much track as possible, six days a week. 680 miles west of Omaha, the Union Pacific began construction on their first tunnel in May of 1868. They ran into trouble with weak rock over a large section of the tunnel, which they eventually chose to blast out rather than reinforcing it because it was the cheaper option. Refusing to accept any delay, the Union Pacific simply built a temporary section of track around it. They did this several times in the future when encountering the relatively few tunnels that were eventually constructed on the rest of the route. As workers pressed on in the summer, they excavated cuts through hard clay and rock, requiring drilling and blasting well into August. In October of 1868, the Union Pacific reached the Green River, and impressively, on October 26th, the men laid over 7 miles of track in one day, rightfully earning triple pay. How could a crew lay any more than that, they thought. As fall turned to winter and the tracks progressed past Evanston, Wyoming, the graders and track layers faced ever colder temperatures, which presented many problems as the ground became quite hard in the winter months. Towards the end of December, the men faced ground frozen two feet deep and so hard they had to blast it as if it was granite. Refusing to stop for the winter this time around, the Union Pacific continued to work into the new year in their race against the Central Pacific. As New Year's Day came and went, the Union Pacific finally reached Utah. Before the main work crews had arrived in Utah, the management of the Union Pacific had decided to begin grading into Utah from Echo Canyon to Ogden, where a man by the name of Brigham Young was hoping to provide work for the men of his community. On May 21st, 1868, Brigham Young had signed a contract with the Union Pacific for Mormons to do grading, masonry, tunneling, and any other necessary prep work for $2,125,000. The work was subcontracted out to bishops and a healthy amount of the profits ended up in the Mormon church. Part of the deal included Durant giving Mormons passes for lower rates on the Union Pacific because converts from Europe were expected to arrive later that year. Young had hoped that the railroad itself would go through Salt Lake City, but the Union Pacific had long since dedicated resources to a more northerly course. Mormons were considered their reliable as they didn't drink, smoke, or gamble unlike the workers on the Union Pacific and the party of gamblers and outlaws that followed them. By the early months of 1869, the Union Pacific relieved the Mormons of their work on the tunnels and began using nitroglycerin to speed up the process. We'll talk much more about the explosive next video. February of 1869 was especially cold. How cold, in fact? Ranging from minus 3 to 20 below zero. But how cold is that, really? 
I think that this quote really puts into perspective how cold that is. The thermometer in the room stood at five below zero. A drop of the hottest coffee spilled upon the cloth froze in a minute, while the gravy was hard on the plate and the butter frozen in spite of the fastest eater. The Union Pacific dealt with winter weather until around March 7th, when the railroad reached Ogden connecting Mormons to the eastern United States. The Mormon crews had allowed the Union Pacific to progress relatively quickly through Utah, leaving behind the snowy weather of the higher elevations. However, this raised the question, where would the Union Pacific meet its western counterpart? This had been debated between the two railroads for months, as both railroads constructed road beds nearer and nearer to each other. It was clear that the Transcontinental Railroad would be finished by year's end, even if the railroads wished that it would continue forever, as the United States government was paying both large sums of money, which found its way into the capitalist pockets. They went as far as building road beds past each other, and it's alleged that the two railroads were now close enough that their grading parties were fighting each other, throwing sod at each other, and even setting off explosions near one another though there aren't really any reliable sources from either railroad to prove it. Eventually, the matter was decided in Washington, D.C. on April 9th that the railroads would meet at Promontory Summit, not Promontory Point, in May of 1869. In April, the Union Pacific laid track all the way to Promontory with relative ease. Most workers received their final check or were sent back east to make improvements on the railroad, while others were to remain until the completion of the last rails and the final ceremony on May 8, 1869. As many of you know, the actual ceremony wouldn't take place until May 10th, for reasons that I'll get into in a moment. On the 10th, the last sections were graded and the tracks were laid down by the Central Pacific. Before the final spikes were to be hammered in, there were several short speeches from the men who managed the railroads. No more than 1,500 people attended the Golden Spike Ceremony, with many of the higher-ups from both railroads not attending at all. Then four final ceremonial spikes were lightly tapped into pre-made holes, including the final spike made from gold. The hammering of the final spike was heard around the entire nation thanks to a wire extension wrapped around the spike itself and the hammer. The wires were connected to a telegraph car broadcasting the moment the final spike was hammered in. I've seen multiple books claim that Leland Stanford attempted to hammer the spike but missed on the first swing. He then gave the hammer to Durant, who also missed. Whether or not this account is actually true is hard to say. After the final spike was hammered in, two locomotives, the Central Pacific's number 60, Jupiter, and the Union Pacific's number 119, came nose to nose, and this famous photograph was taken. There were celebrations all over the nation, from New York to Sacramento, with crowds cheering and bells ringing. For many, this marked the point at which the United States truly became united. So now, let's take a look at some organized labor in the Union Pacific. Organized labor in the Union Pacific typically came in the form of small strikes usually limited to the men within a particular task or trade. Wages were the main motivation for strikes, as I don't recall seeing the men strike for any other reason. The Union Pacific had little tolerance for strikes and did whatever they could to avoid giving in to the workers because they were in a race with the Central Pacific and any delays in construction severely hurt the company financially. The railroad also feared that conceding wage raises would convince the men to continue striking for even higher wages, so they avoided it whenever possible. Often, the Union Pacific would either let the workers go or pay off strike leaders to get them back to work. For instance, some graders on the Union Pacific went on strike in late June of 1868, and by July, all graders from the end of the track to North Platte struck, hoping to gain a wage increase from $2 a day to $8 plus board. The Union Pacific chose not to concede, fearing that the strike would continue anyway. They instead had contractors pay some men their last wages and terminated their employment. Another somewhat common reason for striking was the railroad owing workers back pay. Due to a combination of constantly struggling to find funds and outright greed, the Union Pacific sometimes would simply not pay its workers. An instance of this can be seen when graders from some contractors walked off the job in 1868 until they received back pay, but my favorite example of one of these strikes happened just as the Transcontinental Railroad was about to be completed. A few days prior to the Golden Spike Ceremony, on May 6th, a Union Pacific train carrying VIPs including Durant himself made it to Piedmont, Wyoming where it was stopped by armed tie contractors. They moved the train to a siding and chained Durant's carriage to the tracks, demanding that he pay $200,000 in overdue wages that Durant had neglected for months. There's a rumor that the workers may have been convinced to do this in part by Brigham Young, as Durant also may have owed money to the Mormons, but I haven't seen any reliable sources to confirm this. Durant sent a telegraph to Fort Bridger, pleading for the military to intervene, but the men saw the telegraph. Men then sent their own telegraph to Dodge, threatening to harm the passengers should the army be sent in, and if they did not receive payment, they would organize a general strike along the railroad from Nebraska to Utah. 
Ultimately, Durant was forced to wire Dodge in Ogden City for funds. After an initial payment of $50,000, Durant was allowed to continue to promontory, but the whole ordeal delayed his arrival, causing the Golden Spike ceremony to occur on May 10th rather than May 8th. Outside of this incident, there weren't any other notable actions of organized labor on the Union Pacific, but we'll talk more about labor action on the Central Pacific next video. In the end, the surveyors, graders, and track layers, along with the blacksmiths, chefs, hunters, teamsters, and several other supporting professions were responsible for constructing 1,085 miles of railroad from Omaha to Promontory Point. They pressed westward in 100 degree summers and negative 20 degree winters, over deep valleys and at 8,000 feet, in one of the driest deserts and the wettest of winters. What the workers achieved was truly amazing, and their effect on American society cannot be understated. The railroad decreased the travel time it took for Americans to travel to the west from a month or more to six days for a fraction of the original cost. The railroads laid telegraph wires that allowed the east and the west to communicate easier and presented new trade opportunities to Americans. Asa Whitney had hoped that the Transcontinental Railroad would provide a cheaper, more direct route for transporting goods from its suppliers in China to the United States and by extension Europe. Whitney could have profited heavily from the railroad, but the Suez Canal was completed in late 1869 and Whitney's dreams for exporting Chinese-made goods to Europe did not become a reality. However, it's also important to recognize that the Transcontinental Railroad was one of the catalysts that accelerated American settler colonialism and allowed the nation to make Manifest Destiny a reality. Settlers could easily board a train in Omaha and travel to the Great Plains to claim a 160-acre plot of the prairie while the United States military protected them using any means they deemed necessary, including genocide. And I'm not being hyperbolic here when I say that the United States carried out a prolonged genocide against indigenous peoples in order to settle the Great Plains. Indigenous peoples lost almost everything. They lost the land that they had lived on for generations and the places where their ancestors were buried as they were forced onto reservations. They lost their ways of life as settlers carelessly depleted natural resources to protect their railroad or for their own amusement, and many of them lost their lives when they resisted American settler colonialism. As much as I enjoy reading about trains and railroads, I think it's important to remember how railroads expanded and the negative effects the Transcontinental Railroad had on indigenous peoples. Thanks for watching. This video and the next one took quite a bit of time to research, but I felt that it was important to discuss how and who built the railroads. Anyway, let's talk about book clubs. Socialist book clubs are great because you get to learn about leftist theory with other leftists from the comfort of your own home. Check out a World to Win series on the German Revolution 1917 to 1923 by Pierre Bure and Young Simba's series on settlers by Jay Sakai. I cannot recommend both enough. The next video will be on the Central Pacific, the Chinese immigrants who worked on it, and anti-Asian sentiment in the United States. Trust me, you don't want to miss it. So I'll see you then.